What we're going to focus on in this whole Vuku Zenzele program is, is a lot about digital storytelling. Okay, so that's how do we tell stories through these mediums like phones and computers and the internet. But if we, if we go, if we think back in time, storytelling has existed since, since as far back as we can remember. Okay. So from the beginning of time, humans have been getting together to tell stories. Um, I don't know if you, if you, if we all were to think back on our own lives, you can all think about it for a moment. Like, when do you remember your first story? Like, when did storytelling into your life? Like, think back on, on your life and, and, and can you remember when you first remembered being told a story? Okay, so who, who was telling that story? Was it your mother? Was it your father? Was it your grandmother? Was it the lady at the corner shop? Um, and can you remember, can you remember any of those stories from your childhood? Like if, if I think back, I, I remember in my family, I had a very big family. I've got eight, there's eight children in our family. So there were 10 of us. And we grew up on a farm and there were other families that lived on the farm. So there were always a lot of us around. Um, and in my family, we always sat around the table for dinner. We, 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 it was a rule. You can't just go and eat your dinner in the lounge. We never had a TV my whole life. We never, I've never had a TV and we always ate at the table together. And then when, when, when we were finished eating dinner, my father would read to us from a book. But because he was a farmer, he was also very tired at the end of the day. So by the end of the day, he'd be sitting there like reading to us at the table and then he'd like fall asleep while he was reading. Like, and then we had to wake him up like, dad, dad. And then he'd like wake up and then carry on reading to us. So that's one of my youngest storytelling memories. And then the other one was when, because I was in the bottom half of the children. So um, when all the older kids went to school, which I was very jealous about, I thought school was the coolest thing ever until I actually went there. But when I was young and they went to school and then me and my two little brothers stayed at home, my mother, once everyone had left for school and we'd cleaned up and put everything away, we'd pack a little picnic and then we'd walk down on the farm like into the forest and then we'd find a nice shady place and then we'd all just lie in the grass there and then my mother would just tell us these stories for ages and for me that's one of my favorite memories of being young like lying outside under the trees in the grass and just listening to my mother tell us stories and she was very creative so she would make up completely whack stories which clearly rubbed off because then my little brother I often used to, I was like another mother to him and I would help put him to sleep often at night. And then he would ask me to tell him stories. And then I'd say to him, um, what's, what do you want to hear a story about? And then he'd just make up something completely random. He'd be like, oh, I want to hear a story about a chicken and a goose and a man that fell in the river. And then I'll just make up a story like that. Sorry guys, but sorry. Sun Ellen, Asa anyway, Asa. so those were some of my early storytelling memories, but not for now, but you can in the back of your head start thinking about what were your early stories? Like what do you remember? from your youth and who, who were those storytellers? Like who, who brought you up? Like who, who was telling you those stories as you grew up? Um, okay. And then, so we ask ourselves why, why is storytelling so important? So, I mean, I can think of many reasons why storytelling is important. 
Um, it gives us freedom of expression. So it allows us to have an avenue to express humor and creativity and honesty and vulnerability and emotional, it's an emotional release. So in our meeting last Thursday, like a lot of us spoke about how there's this desperate need for social workers in the community. And I think what one of the reasons we have such a desperate need for social workers is because we no longer have these avenues where we, we naturally used to have when we lived in community, where there were people you could talk to every day. So we didn't let things build up to the extent that we do today. And psychologically, that's really unhealthy. You know, we've still been, being able to tell stories gives us a release and it enables us to also process what's going on in our lives. So it's a very healthy thing to do. And if we don't do that and we don't have the channels to do that, that can cause big psychological problems because we just store everything inside and we never actually, actually get to release them. Another reason storytelling is very important is because it brings us together. You know, now if, if you look at the average household or home, everyone's just in their own room or on their phone or on their computer and not talking to each other. But when, you, when you're telling stories, you, you're together and you're connecting and that allows for deep connection and trust between people, which is in very short supply today. Um, it also allows for information to travel between generations. So that's why the grandparents were often the ones telling the stories because they were using stories to pass on information to future generations. And that's probably one of our like, biggest poverties at the moment is that we're no longer passing information between the generations. We totally cut off a lot of the time from the elders in our community or the elders are stuck in like old age homes, completely removed from their children and their grandchildren. And it's, 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 it's a very sad loss that we no longer have, have that very valuable passing on of information. Like now with Corona, I'm sure a lot of your grandparents would have known a lot of tricks to help boost, boost your immune system. They would have known what plants to use. They would have known how to, you know, take precautions to to stimulate the immune system but because we don't have them in our lives we don't have that information like we forget it and it gets lost and if you do that for one or two generations those stories are lost forever there's no going back um so there's many reasons why storytelling is important and also it helps us to make sense of the world we just you know there's so much information that's thrown at us every single day and it's very hard to process all of that. But I mean, I'm sure Fundisani knows and other artists, Asanda with music or anyone with any form of art, art allows us to kind of make sense of whatever's happening in our lives. So it's, it's also very healthy for that reason. Is there coffee in there? Um, so another word for a story is a myth. Um, and a myth, Here's the dictionary definition, which is quite wordy, but we can, we can unpack it afterwards. Is a traditional, typically ancient story dealing with supernatural beings, ancestors, or heroes that serves as a fundamental type in the worldview of a people, as by explaining aspects of the natural world or delineating the psychology, customs, or ideals of society. Such stories considered as a group is the realm of myth. A popular belief or story that has become associated with a person, institution, or occurrence, especially one considered to illustrate a cultural ideal. Okay, so that's a lot of big words, but basically what it's saying is that stories are what society is built out of. So your customs, your, your, your rituals, your belief systems, they all come from story, okay? So now if we think back to what we just said a minute ago about that we're not getting the stories in the way that we used to, then that, that, then we can see why it's such a big problem because if we as a society are built upon the stories that we are exposed to or 
passed on to us. That's how we build our culture. That's what it's built on. And we're not getting those stories. Then what have we become? Like what are, what, what are we building ourselves on now if we're not getting the stories that we used to get? <clears throat> so basically we are the stories that we tell. So if, if and, and you know, you've probably experienced this in your own lives. If you say something enough, it becomes true. So the stories that we tell become the narrative of our own lives. And that's pretty profound. So if we're no longer hearing stories from our grandparents or our parents or the wise man on the corner or the old lady down the road, then who, who, who are, who are our modern myth makers? Who's telling us stories now? So, I mean, you can all think of, of that for a minute, like where, where do your stories come from? Okay, if I think about myself, like I haven't had much time in the past three months, but normally I read a lot of books. I don't watch TV ever, but I do watch some movies or a bit of Netflix every now and again. Um, luckily, I still do have people in my life that tell stories. So we often get together, we have dinners, we have brides, we have go camping, and we tell stories like that to each other. But um, I'm sure you can all think of quite a few ways that you get stories in your life. And here's some of them. So there's poets, you know, there's wise people, there's healers, there's teachers, there's grandparents, there's musicians, there's church. Church is a very strong source of stories. There's children, there's politicians, and there's the media. So these, this is a big selection of the main ways that we get our stories today. Um, but if you think about it, we used to live in community, okay? So we would live close to a very large extended family. Our grandparents would be there, brothers, sisters, aunties, uncles, like we, we would live near to a very large family group or community group and survival was dependent on us all working together like collaboratively peacefully otherwise we wouldn't have survived no one could survive on their own before but now we've moved to a very consumerist society where we are encouraged the idea of success is based upon you having a big house for just you and your wife or your husband and your two children and your dog and your cat and you separate it. You know, your parents live somewhere far away. Your grandparents live even further away. Like, so we've become completely broken. Like we don't have community like we used to. And, and, and this new kind of insular way of living is very consumerist. So you're encouraged to, you know, work as hard as you can so that you can buy your own house, so that you can put up a new fence, so that you can get a new fridge or a washing machine or whatever, you know. So <clears throat> that's what keeps us in that isolation, is this need for more stuff. So that's what's broken a lot of our systems and created a lot of the injustice that we now currently see and experience. So, even if we look at these storytellers here on the screen, we can, we can already see that a lot of these are being lost because of this way that we're living. So now, if you move to the city or you move to closer to where there's more work or more fun, where the parties are better or whatever, often it means that you then lose touch with, with your immediate family, either your parents or your grandparents. So maybe your, your grandparents moved to the other side of the city or back to a rural area. Then maybe the poet, he couldn't, he, he was very passionate about poetry, but then, you know, because he, he had to have his own house and that meant he had to pay rent, then he has to go and get a job, which meant at the end of the day, he was too tired to write poetry. 
So the poet's no longer around the fire. <clears throat> then maybe the wise woman that used to hang out on the corner, she, she decided that the world had gone very strange and it made her very sad. So she just moved back into her house and no longer sat outside and had conversations with people because she just couldn't handle the pain that she was seeing around her in the world. So the wise women disappeared. And then all the children went to school. So they were no longer around. And then the teachers, the teachers were traditionally very powerful storytellers. But now because the classrooms are so full and there's too many students and there's not enough resources, the teachers are too tired. So they're not telling stories anymore. So suddenly our circle around the fire is getting very small. Um, so then maybe the healer couldn't survive in the city because the healer wanted soil, wanted soil beneath her feet. She didn't want to walk on concrete. So the concrete of the city was making her sick. So she moved far into the mountains. And then the wise man in the neighborhood that everyone used to go to for advice, he started, he couldn't take the cold in his bones anymore. He also was very saddened by what he was seeing in society and how broken people had become and how, <coughs> you know, communities had become so broken. So to make himself feel better, he started drinking. And then he drank and he drank and eventually he drank so much that he forgot all of his stories. So he left the fire. Then the musicians, who ordinarily are probably one of the most powerful storytellers in a society, they suddenly started getting paid by big alcohol brands, by Hollywood, by Nike, by Coca-Cola, to make songs to sell us stuff. So now our music isn't music anymore, it's actually just advertising. So now you can see our fire's looking very dismal. Basically, the fire went out and now we've replaced it with screens, with our phones, with our computers. And there's not very many storytellers left at our fireside. Basically, we've got religion, media and politics. Okay, so now if we think back to what we said a little while back about stories being what shapes us as a culture, which shapes us as the human species. And if now the only stories we're getting are from religious leaders, politicians, and the media, who is essentially just there to sell us stuff, then what kind of society are, are we building? So now our fire has gone very cold. <laughs> There's not even like embers glowing in the dark there. And this is what it's become everybody on a screen not talking to each other not having conversations just engaging never with the present always just you know obsessing about something that's not even in the room so instead of talking to each other we're just looking at loads and loads of information mostly designed to sell us stuff So we've moved from a very connected community-based living that actually was very healthy. Like if we look back a hundred years in time, I don't think many people can deny that most of us had a much better quality of life than or our parents or grandparents or great-grandparents than we do now. We've basically managed to kind of in a hundred years, <laughs> almost destroy the earth and ourselves. And I think that us letting the fire go out and becoming obsessed with screens and, and that as a medium of engagement has had a lot to do with our destruction. But at the same time, these networks, you know, this technology, this thing that we are trying to figure out so that we can do these online learnings now in the situation where we're not allowed to meet in person, 
in big groups. It's incredible technology. It's not like the technology itself is evil or bad or wrong. The technology is incredible and has incredible potential. Like what we can do now with this Vuku Zenzele course, if we manage to plug into the right technology, is phenomenal. And that desire for stories and storytelling, it hasn't gone away. Like we still have it in us. That's why we obsess with our phones. That's why we binge watch Netflix, because we're still hungry for stories. And now we have all these incredible networks at our fingertips. So there's no reason why we shouldn't be telling stories, but good stories, not corrupt stories or manipulative stories or stories designed to make people buy stuff or do stuff or keep people in poverty, but our own stories that shape us, how we want to be, you know, shape our future in the way that we want it to be shaped not carry on the narrative of someone else's agenda. So these images are incredibly powerful. They don't look like much, but basically this is London and this isn't a map. Okay. So there's a few of these and they're all the big cities around the world. And essentially it's two different social media platforms. The blue lights are, for example, say like, WhatsApp or Facebook and the orange lights could be Instagram. So these maps are literally made up uh, of data. So every blue dot on this map is every time someone uploads a picture to Facebook and every orange dot is every time someone uploads a picture to Instagram. So essentially you can see the whole geography of the city just through people posting on social media which is quite phenomenal you can see the main roads you can see where there's a natural barrier you can see rivers you can see where like dense city centers are and that's not a map. This is not a map of the world. This is just the lights that show every time people are uploading visuals to these social media platforms. It's nice and dark here in Africa, thank goodness. <laughs> but North America, hectic, and Europe, very, very crazy. Okay, so my question, I guess, is what what are these stories what are we putting out there what are these stories that we are putting out there that are shaping us and our future generations you know what are you guys what are you posting every day on social media what do you write about on facebook what do you write post about on instagram i mean if these are essentially the last storytellers left at the fireplace then you, we're not going to be getting a hugely diverse narrative. Each one of these things has its own agenda. So all the stories we're getting are to serve these ag agendas. Okay. And then you add advertising, which is probably the most powerful storyteller left at the, the old fireplace. And they're powerful because they have billions and billions and billions of rands to spend on advertising. Okay. So they the sole purpose of their storytelling is to sell us stuff. And who's paying, who's paying those millions and billions and billions of rands? We, we are paying. So we are paying for advertising and politics and religion to sell us stories that make us mostly actually feel really shit about ourselves because most advertising is designed to make you feel bad unless you buy something to make you feel better. So advertising tells you if you don't have that new phone or those new shoes or that new hairdo, then you're not good enough. So that's how advertising works. It makes you feel really bad about yourself so that you go and spend money to feel better about yourself. Okay, but obviously that's not authentic. You're never going to feel better about yourself. 
because that's how the system's designed. It needs you to feel bad about yourself so that you keep buying stuff. So basically, we, we're now stuck in this loop. And because advertising is so powerful, and it would be very boring if they were just like, okay, new Nike sneakers, 6,000 Rand, come and get them. They, they close their advertising in storytelling. So they don't say, come buy Nike sneakers for 6,000 Rand. They say, they make up a beautiful story with beautiful imagery about this amazing runner or this powerful person or this beautiful person. And then they evoke those feelings in you. You're like, oh my goodness, that person is so amazing, so successful, so popular. I have to go buy those shoes because I want to be like that. So because advertising is so powerful all of these other storytellers end up using advertising to get their own messages out so science religion politics they all wrap their stories and they all get mixed up in advertising okay so basically you can see what starts to happen because <coughs> what you put in is what you get out so yeah if this is what we are seeing all the time in advertising, then we start to think that that's how we should look. We base our models of success on, on what we are seeing in advertising. So then very soon we start looking exactly like these adverts that are being shoved down our throats every single day. It's in TV, it's in the newspaper, it's in magazines, it's on Instagram, it's on Facebook, it's everywhere you look. So you start to believe that that's how you need to look in order to be successful or that's what you need to have in order to be successful or popular or liked or good enough okay and i don't think any of us can argue that it's not a pretty picture like how we've become it's not great it's not authentic it breeds insecurity it breeds jealousy it breeds fighting it breeds lying it's not a it doesn't have a strong moral makeup in fact, quite the opposite. It destroys all of our morals as society. So I'm just going to quickly go through a bit of history of advertising and we can look at what advertising has been telling us. This is a hundred years of advertising from a hundred years ago till now. Okay. <coughs> so if we look back then, you can see we're being told, okay, this is what nice hair looks like. This is what nice eyes look like. If you want to be a good housewife, you should have this washing machine. No, do your nails so that your husband likes you. Like all of these adverts are telling women how to behave in order to be liked. Okay. <laughs> you look at this one. Wives, look this over carefully. Circle the item you want for Christmas. Show it to your husband. If he does not go to the store immediately, cry a little not a lot just a little he'll go i mean what what is that saying about gender and power dynamics you know show her it's a man's world she's on her knees serving him tea in bed like really or seven up the fresh family drink makes it look like this wonderful healthy happy family nah it's sugar it's killing you killing you you know he comes first you know, make sure you look after him before you do anything else. So all of this messaging, and you can see 99 of 99 percent of advertising for like a very long time until very recently was very white. You never saw faces of color or anyone, even you know, diversity, disabled people or old people or it was always just very white very stereotypical very like mono no diversity okay, again it just carries on and on and on. i mean a baby they're using a baby's face to sell cigarettes <coughs> making women look weak making everyone want more stuff more stuff more stuff i need a washing machine i need a vacuum cleaner we need a new car we need another washing machine because that one's now old we need a tv we need this we need this this is yeah 
And this carries on and on and on. Okay, and now we start to get a little bit more colorful. <coughs> and you can see also that as time goes on, like in the beginning, adverts were mostly writing. And now they're becoming more and more visual, like big, mostly photo with a little bit of writing or less writing. And again, advertising straight at children, you know. Children are, advertising often targets children directly because people will spend money on their children before they spend money on themselves. So they'll advertise straight to the children and the children are like, mommy, I want this, mommy, I want this. And eventually mommy will get it. And now you can see even more, it's more visual, less writing, but still the same messaging really. Okay, so this is kind of where we're at now, more or less. And you can see it's pretty much predominantly pictures with a tiny bit of writing. Because that's also what's happened throughout the past hundred years, <coughs> is we've, we've, we're forgetting how to read and think for ourselves. And we just, we just want to see stuff. We want to see visuals. We want to watch a video. We don't want to read or think of, or have to figure things out for ourselves which is very dangerous because that's how we become enslaved when we stop thinking for ourselves and we just follow orders. Okay, so you can see here the change in advertising over time. It starts with just writing, then mostly writing with a bit of picture and then less and less and less until it's basically just visuals with one or two words. And then advertising, like anything, you know, whatever can be used for bad can also be used for good. But the problem is all the money, <laughs> like it doesn't, you know, trying to convince people to use less is not exactly in the interest of most of the people putting the money into advertising. So the amount of advertising used for good is a tiny percentage in comparison to the advertising that's used for bad but it's a powerful tool that can be used for good if you can find someone willing to pay for it. Okay, so how do we, how do we change this? You know, do we, do we want that to become our narrative? Do we want our society to be built on those morals or those storylines? Or do we wanna go back to the fireplace and think about it a little bit and figure out what stories we do want to tell? Because we know that our stories we tell are what are shaping us as the human species and as communities and as groups of communities. So it's very, very, very important, the stories we tell, because that's what we become. Okay, so I think what we need to do is go back to the fire <laughs> and leave our devices alone for a while and actually just reconnect with each other and ourselves and start to seriously, seriously think about the stories that we're putting out there or that we want to put out there. And then when we have a solid idea of that, then we can come and use these incredible technologies that connect us to everyone on every corner of the world, like in an instant, just one click of a button and you can speak to the entire world. That's super powerful. But if we're going to do that, we need to make sure that we're telling stories that are worthwhile, that are worth listening to, that are worth putting out there, and that we think are shaping us into better people. Okay, so that's what I would like us all to think about in this next week until we meet again, is how do we use, how do we use these networks constructively? And, and what stories do we want to tell?